Last week we started uh, this new series entitled uh, The God of Order and the Order of God. And I shared with us on last Sunday as well, our theme for this year is setting things in order. Setting things in order. Um, we, we saw how in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 3, the writer states that it was by faith that God framed the worlds or the universe so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Uh, the term framed in the Greek means that God arranged, he set in order, he equipped, he, and he adjusted the worlds. The term worlds is aeons and it means the universe. And it signifies ages and denotes an indefinitely long period of, of uh, time. Uh, this aeons or this world, universe, includes the celestial and the terrestrial worlds. And then we went over to Hebrews 1 and verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, and it tells us that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. We shared with you from Isaiah 45 and 18 uh, that it says, uh, God created the heavens and formed the earth and formed it, the earth, to be inhabited. Psalms 115 and 16 says that the heavens, even the heaven of heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. God formed the earth to be inhabited. We also looked at how many scientists have, have had to admit, they've had to admit and embrace the idea of intelligent design because of what is called the uh, uh, anthropic principle. Uh, in the last few decades, many scientists who, whose discoveries in astronomy and nature of atoms, the genetic code and DNA and the complexity of the biological systems have had to make the concept of purposeless, random, accidental universe logically indefensible. And we talked about this, this anthropic principle and how it states overwhelmingly scientific evidence demonstrates that the precise design and finally balanced fundamental forces governing our universe, there's no way that this could have happened by accident. They argue persuasively that our universe was either designed by a supernatural intelligence, namely God, or that there are an infinitely, or infinity rather, of universes that don't support life and we just happen to be the only one that does. We talked about the intelligent design of the strong and weak nuclear fields, the gravitational and electromagnetic forces, the elements of hydrogen and oxygen, and how they are necessary to the existence of the universe and human life. We talked about the curious nature of water and how it's one of the most vital elements in the existence of our life. We looked at the size of the earth and the sun, the distance between the earth and the sun, and how all the factors are absolutely essential for the existence of life on our planet. If the sun was too close, we'd burn up. If it was farther away, we'd freeze to death. Can you say amen? Uh, we talked about how the earth is tilted at a 23 degree inclination and the earth rotates at 100, I mean 1,002 miles per hour, which allows our planet to rotate once every 24 hours. The moon controls the tides of the ocean and is 293,000 miles from the earth. And if it were any closer, we would experience 35 to 50 feet tidal waves over the Earth's, over most of the Earth's surface. And finally, we looked at how God set things in order in creation and how he created and set everything in place in order. And he set it not only in place, but he set it in order before he made animal, fowls, and finally mankind. Now today, we're going to go further in this. Verse number three of Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God 
so that the things which are seen would not be made of things which are visible. This is our foundational text for this series. Go to 1 Corinthians, if you would, chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the governmental order in the home. The governmental order in the home. God is a God of order. Remember we said wherever there is chaos or wherever there is mess, God doesn't bless mess. He doesn't bless chaos, but he'll speak to chaos and bring order out of chaos. What we're going to be dealing with here today and perhaps on next Sunday is setting things in order in our homes. Can I get an amen? We're going to look at foundational things today. First, Corinthians 11, starting at verse number one, the apostle Paul writes, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. This is the verse I want you to get. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. God's governmental order in the home. The head of the man is Christ, so therefore the man submits to Christ. The head of the woman is the man, therefore the woman submits to the man. And the head of Christ is God. Christ submits to God. Order. Everybody say order. Glory to God. Um, go over to Genesis now, chapter number 2. Because that's kind of what we closed on last week in Genesis, the book of Genesis. If you want to know how things, how God intended for things to be, you have to go back to the beginnings. Go back to the beginnings. Because when he set things in order in the beginning of the way things should be, if man had to follow God's design, we would have had a chaotic mess that we have today. But it was because man wanted to do his own thing. Because man got away from what God designed. That it created chaos for the rest of us. And even though there's chaos for the rest of us. Even in the church. Even in the church. If we would, if we would just, if we would just align ourselves with his order, it can straighten out the chaos in our lives. Can you say amen? amen. Genesis chapter number two, verse number seven. And it reads, and the Lord God formed the man formed man whether of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. The King James translation will say a living soul. Verse 8 says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 9 and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go down to verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely Die, And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I will make him a helper 
comparable to him. Now, in Genesis 1, God created mankind in his own image and after his likeness. Uh, he created them male and female and gave them, the both of them, dominion, the authority to rule over the earth. In Genesis chapter number 1, God created the spiritual nature of man, uh, the true essence of our being. The spirit, uh, uh, that is rather the part of man that is created in the image and after the likeness of God. We see in Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 7 how God formed the physical and soulish part of man. The male was, was made first and there was an interlude of time before the female was made. The first thing that I want to look at here today, and I hope you have uh, something you can take notes on, particularly those, those of us who are men. I want you to take some notes and get this today because what I'm going to talk about first is the male's priority. The male's priority. If you don't, if, if you're not a man, you're a sister, and, uh, but you got a man in mind, take some notes and email them to him, text them to him. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> the male's priority. God made the male first. Brethren, I hope you listen to me today because this is very important. Because it's something that we need to understand about why God created us first. He made the male first. He made you first. He made male first. Listen to me very carefully as I get into this today. Because there's much that we learn about God's purpose for the male by what the male saw, heard, and learn during this interlude, this period of time before he made a female. Now remember Genesis 1, he created the spirit part of man, male and female, gave them the dominion, all right, the, the authority to rule over the earth. But in Genesis 2, the physical part of man is made now. Not the physical part of woman has not been made yet, just the physical part. Of the man has been made. The spiritual part of man, a woman was created, or female was created, but the physical part of man is made in verse number seven of Genesis chapter number two. The aura in which the male was created gives us the first indication of his reason for being, his purpose. Why did God make the male first? It was not because the male was better, but because of his purpose. The male came directly from the earth. The female came from the side, the rib of the male. The reason for this is that the male was designed by God to be the foundation of the human family. The woman came out of the man rather than out of the earth because she was designed to rest on the male as he supports her. So, so men... The male was made first because God intended for the male to be the foundation of the family. Amen. Let me say it again. God created the male first because he intended for the male to be the foundation of the family. Now get this because this is going to be good today. No contractor builds a house starting with the roof. You don't start with the roof. You don't start with the rafters. You don't start with the windows. You start with the foundation. And that's why God did it. Just like any other builder, the priority in the building is always what you need to do first. You start with the foundation. Brethren, God created you first because you are the foundation. Everything rests upon you. Yes, yes, Glory to God. Amen. God's communication to, to man in the Bible indicates the importance he places on building from the foundation up. 
What did Jesus describe as our foremost priority? Uh, what we're building on. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. Write that down. Listen to what Jesus said in these verses. He says, therefore, whoever hears these, work, these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Verse 25 says, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. Can I get an amen? amen. Founded on the rock. Verse 26 says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Verse 27 says, and when the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, it, and it fell, and great was its fall. What Jesus was saying, in effect, was, now some of you are building on sand. Your building looks good, but I don't care how good your building looks. If your foundation isn't right, there's going to be a great crash. You're the foundation. You're the foundation. You're the foundation. We are the foundation of our families. So we have to have it together. And, and, and listen, listen. God intended for you to be the foundation of the family because, because as I stated, everything Everything has to support itself on you. And, and if you were not capable of being the foundation, God never would have made you the foundation. Can I get an amen? So you got to know, you have to know that, that there's a lot on you. You got to get it together. You got to hold it down. You got to man up. Because if the foundations are cracked, everything else is going to fall apart. This is why, look, this is why that's such an attack on us. Now listen to me very carefully here because, you know, I remember back years ago, back, uh, whew, man, 70s, you know, you remember how the image of the black man was depicted yes. as being evil, oh, yeah. a, a uh, criminal, yeah, yeah, a pimp. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Y'all remember the black exploitation movies? Yeah. And pimping was cool, man. Being a pimp, yeah. But you know, you had your platform shoes and your yeah, you know, your hat being super fly and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, what was his name? Yeah, the Mac. <laughs> Max Julia. Pippin. All that stuff was cool. So, you know, those are the images that were depicted of us. And then from there, you know, not only being pimps, but being thugs, gangsters. And. And then, y'all remember Tarzan? Yes, sir. You know, Tarzan, uh, what part of Africa was he in? <laughs> Didn't say what part he was in. Africa is, I believe, maybe the largest continent on the planet. Yes, yes. One white guy oh, yeah. rules all those Africans. Are oh, y'all listening to what I'm saying? So black man was depicted as being weak and inferior to the white man. And then let's go a little further because then you have the crack epidemic that came into our communities. And if we dig a little deep, if we dig a little deep, we find that that was by, that was by design. It was by design by the United States government. 
And if we keep going, you know, you'll see how not only was it by design, but it, it caused many of our men to spend time in prison, years in prison, away from our families. Well, you'll listen to what I'm saying. And so when, when, when our men are imprisoned and away from their families, then our children grow up in a home without what? Foundation. And what was meant to be a support for the family, now the woman has to become that. She has to be the backbone of the family. She has to be what God never intended for her to be. God intended for you and me, brethren, to be the foundation for our families. Can I get an amen? Let's keep going. Let's keep going because, you know, when, when you have the crack epidemic, you have our men going to prison, you have poor education, opportun educational opportunities for our children, particularly our young boys get to the fourth grade. If they begin to struggle, well, we better build more prisons because we know that this one is not going to graduate. He's going to be on the streets doing crime, and we're going to need some private prisons. All this stuff is by design. Now, let me say this. All of it is by design, and much of it is propaganda to, to depict an image of you that you are no good. When in reality, there are a whole lot of good black men. There are a whole lot of black men who do have education. And there are a whole lot of black men who are the foundations of their family. And that they are in their homes taking care of their children. But once the image is out there, more people are going to believe the negative as opposed to believing the reality. They believe the perception of black men. Well, y'all listen to me today. But I want you to understand this. You, you brother, you. You are, and me, we are the foundation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 11, he says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So God doesn't think of foundations in terms of only concrete and water, but also in terms of people. What Christ is to the church, because she is his bride, you and I are to our wives and our families. Can you say amen? amen. Let's keep going here. Um, uh, so don't, so yeah, yeah, yeah. God, he, he began by laying the foundation of the male. God placed the male at the bottom of the entire building of humanity. This means that society is only as strong as its males. And if the males don't learn what it means to be a strong foundation in God, then society is sunk. And if, male, if the male leaves the home or if he neglects his responsibility, you have a house, you have, you have a home, you have a family that's built on sand. And when the male has cracks and faults in the substructure of his life, then the whole building is on shaky ground. No man, let, now, now men, let's, let's talk about this because this is the year you have to decide to get yourself on solid ground. Amen. To get yourself in order. For as the man goes, so goes the family, society, and the world. And take a look at the conditions of our society and nature. How do you think the men in our society are doing? Wow. Our, our societies are in a mess because as a foundation, men have become sandy, uncertain, and unstable. And how can you build a human race 
on a foundation that is full of sand mixed with straw. A foundation is always measured by how much weight can be placed on it. And when God made the first, uh, made the male first, he wasn't saying that the male is more important than the female. He was saying that the male has a specific responsibility. He has a purpose to fulfill that is just like the foundations of any other building. And even though the foundation is important, it's not more important than the other parts of the building. The foundation can't perform all the functions itself. So men, you need to live like the foundation you were created to be. Just be there and keep the home steady so that your wife and your children can always lean on you and know that you're not going to crack. And many children today with absentee fathers, men who are missing either physically or emotionally, are walking in mud instead of on concrete. And these young boys are trying to find foundation for their lives. But there's mud all over them because there's just no place where they can stand on solid ground. Their foundations are missing. Then when they grow up, they don't know or they won't know how to be the foundation and oftentimes won't even know what they are supposed to be. How many of y'all remember the movie Fences? Some of you all have heard me say this, and you probably know what I'm about to say. One of the greatest scenes in that movie, Fences, with Denzel Washington, was when he had a talk with his youngest son. And his youngest son asked him, why is it that you don't like me? <laughs> why don't you like me? And Denzel jacked him up. And he essentially told him, I don't have to like you. I put food on the table. I put a roof over your head. I put clothes on your back. I don't have to like you. I do all these things because I'm obligated to you to do this. I don't have nothing to do with whether or not I like you. Now, that was a powerful scene, but the most powerful scene in that movie was when he was sitting in the backyard with his oldest son and his best friend. And he started talking about his father and his relationship with his father. And Denzel essentially explained how hard his father was on him. And how whatever Denzel got that he thought was good for himself, his father wound up taking it away from him. And I realized the impact of those two scenes was that what was going on with Denzel and his youngest son was that he could not give to his youngest son what his father had not given to him. What his youngest son needed from him, he was unable to give it to him because his father had not given that same thing to him. And you cannot give what you don't have. Are you listening to me today? And so here this young man is, he's messed up because he doesn't think his father likes him. His father doesn't know how to express how he loves him and how much he appreciates and he is proud of him because his father never did it for him. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? And I want to say to us in here today, if, if we never got from, if we never received from our fathers the things that we need as men, that things that we needed as boys, the things that we need as Husbands, if we never receive those things from our fathers, it's probably because they didn't know how to give them to us. But we don't have an excuse now because we have the word of God and the word of God will give us everything that we need so that we can give to our sons what they need to become the men that God created them to be. To be foundations in the family. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. Glory to God. So man, brethren, yes. 
brethren, you're the foundation. Foundation. Amen? Amen. Priority. Now, now that we looked at the priority, let's look at the male's position. The male's position. This is probably where we end today. Um, man's priority in creation not only means that he was designed to be the foundation of the human family, but also that he was the first to be positioned on the earth according to God's purpose. He was the first to have a relationship with God, to experience God's creation and receive God's instruction. Remember we read, God said to the man, every tree in this garden you can eat from it, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. In the day that you eat of that, you will surely die. He said that to the man before he created the woman. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say amen? amen? So man got direct instructions from God. When you read in chapter 3, when the woman was dealing with the serpent, she knew the instructions that, the, that, that God had given to her husband. How did she know it? Because it was the responsibility of the husband to give it to the wife. Let me say this to his brethren. Because you are the priest in the home, you're the spiritual leader in the family. Your foundation, spiritual leader. Yeah. Therefore, uh, that means in your home, you the pastor, right. not me. Right. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I'm the pastor of my home. Amen. Now, when you come down here, I'm your pastor. Yeah, right. Can I get an amen? amen? But but in your home, you are the spiritual leader. Yeah. And I want to give you an example of something. Whenever you come here on Sunday morning, I'm always prepared to teach you the scripture. You can't teach your family the scripture if you're not prepared. Can I get an amen? That means you have to spend time in the word so that you can lead your family spiritually, so you can teach them, so they can know. Amen? Um, so not only did, did he have instructions from God, but he also had a place to live. Remember we talked about that about two, three Sundays ago. The man had a place to live in the garden. In the garden. That was his home. He had a home, place to live before he had a wife. He had instructions from God before he had a wife. That's order. Before we even think about getting married, single brothers, before you even think about getting married, make sure you have a relationship with your creator. Make sure you have a place to live and a job to pay for the place. Can I get an amen? That's harder. That's harder. Now let's go a little further in this because uh, let's look at his place. His place to live in the garden. The male was placed in the environment in which he was meant to carry out his purpose. Genesis 2 and 8 says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and they put the man whom he formed. Uh, this point is very crucial. God put the man in the environment in which he was supposed to remain in order for him to fulfill his reason for being. What was this environment like? What was it like? It was like a place of heaven on earth, the Garden of Eden, paradise. Eden comes from the Hebrew word meaning delicate, delight, or pleasure. The word garden means an enclosure or something fenced in. And this was more than an ordinary garden. All that was influenced in heaven influenced that particular location on earth. God did not start by placing man over the entire earth or by placing him just anywhere on the earth. He placed man at the spot called Eden where there was glory. It was a glory connection between the seen and the unseen. There was glory flowing back and forth from this particular place on the earth. 
The garden can be considered God's incubator for his new offspring. And sometimes a, a newborn baby is placed in an incubator so that he can become physically acclimated to his environment. In a sense, man was in God all along. And since he was chosen before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1 and 4, it was as if man was so used to the environment of being in God that God chose a special place on the planet and put his anointing on it for the sake of man when he put him on the earth. In this way, the transition wouldn't be a strain on him. He could live in a controlled environment and a, a little spot of heaven on earth. Now you have to remember, Genesis chapter 1 created what? The spirit part of man. The part of man that was in God's likeness and in his image and after his likeness. I just quoted Ephesians 4, I mean 1 and 4, how God chose us before the foundation of the world. God chose us in eternity. So there was a time in eternity, if I can say it like that, when before the earth was created, the earth was formed, that God knew us. Paul said in, the, in Romans 8 and 29, for those he foreknew, he knew us before. And then he says he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So God knew us, he knew all of us before the foundations of the world. And if God foreknew and he knew us before, and one of his attributes is that he is omniscient, which means that he is all-knowing, or he is perfect in knowledge, that means that there was never a time when God didn't know us. He has always known you, he's always known me. Can you say amen? amen? There was never a time when God did not intend for you to be born. There was never a time when God didn't intend for you to have purpose. He's always known you. He's always had purpose for your life. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. And so when, when I say it was like, like Adam was in God all along. God always knew Adam. It was as if God were pregnant with Adam. And he simply gave birth to him. Put him in the garden. The garden was like an incubator. Can I get an amen? amen. Glory to God. <laughs> let, me, let me go on and try to finish up here. Now look at this. This is a place of God's continual presence here because... A central reason that God placed the man in the garden was so that he could be in his presence all the time. Yeah. He could walk and talk with the Lord in the cool of the day. He could hear God's voice. This was a place where communion, fellowship, and oneness with God was always intact. A manufacturer will always position a part in the location where it can best carry out its purpose. Similarly, we can conclude from what we've learned about the environment of the garden that the primary purpose of the male is to be in God's presence. The male is not wired to function outside the presence of the Lord. Are y'all getting this? Here's the significance. God never intended for Adam to move from the garden. He intended for the garden to move over the earth. God wanted Adam to take the presence of the garden and spread it throughout the world. And this is what he meant when he told Adam to have dominion over the earth. This is still God's purpose. Isaiah 11 and 9 says, the earth will be full of knowledge the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Adam could only fulfill this purpose. Only, uh, only he was in constant communion with God in the garden. Yeah. So God designed the man 
formed him first to be the foundation, but he formed him first and communicated with the man so that the man could be in constant communication with God. How many of y'all know? Many of you know, brother. If we are not in constant communication with God, greater the chances we have of messing this thing up. Um, that's why prayer is so important. Yes, yes. Having a prayer life. Yeah. And I didn't get that until I got saved. Uh, I got in the word, you know, uh, sitting on the past that was teaching us the importance of prayer. Because my prayer life, many of y'all know, was very short and sweet. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord, my soul to hear I'm a grown man saying that praise. <laughs> I said that prayer for a long time. Oh, I know y'all I know y'all don't say that prayer I know y'all don't say that prayer but I did for a long time <laughs> that's alright but it wasn't until it wasn't until I learned how to pray that my prayer life developed and increased over the years. So prayer to me, or for me, is not just something I do before I go to bed. It's something I do all day long. Amen. When I hear my son leaving the house in the mornings, I pray. Are oh, you listening to what I'm saying? When I get up and get ready to have my coffee, I'm praying. Glory to God. When I leave my house, I'm praying. Before I even get ready for bed, I'm praying. You could just go to bed. Get a certain age, you have to get ready for bed. Glory to God. Got to get ready for bed. But I'm praying. I'm praying all throughout the day. I'm trying to stay in constant communication with God because I need to hear from him. I need him to speak to me in my spirit. I need to hear from him. And I want to talk to him because prayer is not just monologue. Prayer is dialogue. It's not me giving my request to God all day long. God, I want you to bless me with this. God, will you bless me? God, will you do this? God, will you do this? No, no, no. It is dialogue. We talk to God. We listen to hear from God. Amen? I need you to speak to me. I need you to say to me what I need to know, what I need to hear. And if a man is not living in the presence of God, he might be moving, but he's not really functioning. And outside the presence of God, he's dangerous. Un he's a dangerous, uncontrolled beast. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32, that a man without God is a creature without conscience. So you can't trust the perspective of a man who doesn't know God. You cannot totally trust the perspective of one who is just beginning to know God either because he's still getting used to the presence. Amen. Amen. Now let me close with this. It's only by continually being in God's presence that our minds and our hearts can be renewed. We need to learn to walk in step with the Spirit. Paul wrote in Galatians 5 and 25, he says, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk also in the Spirit. 
If we walk in the spirit rather than our own ideas about life, the prophet Jeremiah tells us this. He says in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's why, that's why we have to yield our lives over to the spirit of God. Because my own heart, Jeremiah said, is wicked and deceitful. Can say man. That's why we need God, brethren. We need him for real. We don't need just a form of godliness. But we need God for real. I need God. I'm telling you, if I don't have him in my life, if I don't yield myself over to him, my will, to his will, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. I will mess this thing up. I need him. Any, anybody else in here, any other brother understand what I'm talking about today? I need God. I can't do this by myself. I'm telling you, every day of my life, and it's almost as if sometimes every minute of every day, there's always something that's pulling at you and tugging at you and trying to draw you away from the presence of God. But sometimes you got to fight to stay in his presence. you got to fight to stay in his presence. Because I'm telling you, you're the foundation. And if the foundation is cracked, have you ever had lived in a house where the foundation was cracked. You try to open the door. <laughs> can't open the door because when the foundation is cracked, it causes the frame to shift. Walls start cracking. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Windows won't let up because the wall is not being supposed to be. When the foundation is cracked. We need God. That's the bottom line. We need God. We need God. Let's stand to our feet. We need God. We need God. We need God. We need God. We need Him. We need him. We need him. We need him. You know, men, we 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 we've been taught all of our lives. You know, been taught all of our lives. Never let them see you sweat. Don't show any emotions. People ask you how you're doing. Oh, I'm good. I'm good, Doc. I'm good. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm good too. I'm good too. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff we, we we talk about when in reality we got a lot of stuff going on that we oftentimes feel like we don't have anybody we can talk to about it. Got some things going on in our lives that we don't feel like we can talk to anybody about. Yes, yes. If, if you talk to your wife about how you feel, yeah. you know, there's a danger when becoming vulnerable. You're afraid that if I talk to my wife about how I'm feeling about certain things, that she'll come back and use that against me someday. So men fear that kind of stuff. Can't talk to my wife about this, man. You know, come back and throw that in my face. Can't talk about that. And then you don't want to talk to no other brother because, you know, another brother may say, man, you weak, man. You need to man up. You need to man up and he need to man up his own self. You got some stuff going on with him. You just don't have anybody sometimes you feel like you can talk to what's going on within you who will listen to what you're saying. Hear me. Hear me out, man. 
And then I guarantee you that men would just be honest and we would just start talking about stuff, some of the same thing that we're going through, other brothers are going through also. So we ain't in this thing by ourselves. I want to pray for the brother in the day. Who want to be prayed for? You need some prayer? Come on, I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you. I know we go through stuff. I know we go through stuff. You know, I ain't got time to be macho and all that kind of stuff. And act like I got it all together. Talking about it's all good. It ain't all good. I got some stuff, man. Got some stuff going on right now. You know, we, we, if I lose my job, my family may lose everything. I cannot afford that. And if, if that happens, if my family loses everything, then I am a failure. I don't want to be no failure. I don't want to be a failure. I need to hold it together, man. I need to get this thing right because my family needs me. I'm the foundation. They need me. They need me. They need me. Now, I'm going to say this to us, brother. Now, I can pray. I can pray. But uh, I'm just going to be honest. Because we all need prayer. But after I pray, when we leave here today and we go on back to life, you got to take the necessary steps in your own life that you need to take to get your life in order. You know what those steps are. You know what the, the things are that are the risk to causing your foundation to crack. Because if your foundation cracks, you, your family is at risk of falling apart. You know what those things are. So after I pray for you today, after I pray for you today, brothers, you go do the work that you need to do to set those things in order. Can I get an amen? amen. Sisters, I want y'all to point your hands toward the brother in the day. As if, as if these are the foundations that we're leaning on, that we're supporting because we need foundation. I'm so glad to see all these brothers here today. We got a lot of brothers in our church. A lot of good men too. I love these brothers. Amen. Love these brothers. Most of your churches are filled with women, dominated by women. But God made you first, brothers. Made you first to lead. Father, I lift up our men to you today. You know the issues that we have in our lives. You know the secrets of our hearts. You know the skeletons in our closets. You know the struggles that we are faced with every day of our lives. You know the pressure that we are under. You know, God, the temptations that we face and oftentimes have even yielded to God. You know. You know. And we want to say to you today, Father, that we need you because we can't do this. We absolutely cannot do this without you. And because you made us first, you made us to be the foundation of our families, God, we're saying to you today that we need you to pour concrete into the cracks to stabilize us, to stabilize us as men. God, help us to do the works that we need to do, the Heavenly Father, so that our foundation won't fall apart. Our foundations won't crack. They won't break. They won't be destroyed. And our families won't fall apart. I pray today, Father God, in the name of Jesus, for every man around this altar today, you know, you know what all our men need. You know what I need as a man. God, and I'm asking that you would help us today. I'm asking that you would help us today. Lord, we say to you, every one of us around this altar today, first of all, we acknowledge sin in our lives and we repent of any sin, God, that is in our lives. God, we don't want to leave here today and keep this sin in our 
life. We repent of it right now in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. And then, God, we're asking for your help. We're asking, God, that you would help us to get this sin out of our lives completely, dear Heavenly Father. We're praying, Lord God, that the struggles that we have, the, the uh, temptations that we have, Lord, and that some of us have yielded to in the past, we're asking today, God, that you would show us always the way of escape and give us the strength and the desire to take that exit, to leave when it's getting too tempting for us, God, and not yield to it, dear Heavenly Father. I pray today in Jesus' name, God, that every one of these men around this altar will man up, that we will be the men that you created us to be, Lord God, that we won't make excuses for what we cannot do, but we'll know, God, that we have a word. You have given us a word. You have given us your word, Lord, and your word lays out instructions for us on what we need to do and how we can become everything that you created us to be. So, God, I pray for blessings upon each and every man today. Lord God, as we leave this altar, Lord God, and we go back to our seats and we leave this church today and go back to our homes, go back to our occupations on this week and our daily routines. I pray that we will make prayer a priority in our lives so that we can always be in your presence, Lord. That we can always be in your presence because we need you, Lord. We need you, God. We desperately need you. Forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Renew a right spirit within us. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from us. Oh God, oh God, we need you, Father. We bless you, God, and we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. And it's in Jesus' mighty name. Let everybody say amen. amen. And come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise today. All right, brothers, go back to your seats, but just know you got to do the work. You got to do, amen? You got to do the things that you need to do. Do the things. Let's worship the Lord today, everybody. Come on, let's worship God today. Let's worship him.